Bang! First, we will start with a fireside chat. The host of this one is the world's leading blockchain uh, educator, uh, and with over 100,000 subscribers on YouTube, 20,000 followers on Twitter, and over 6 million video views. Please put your virtual hands together for the CEO and co-founder of Superfarm, Elliot Trades. He will be speaking to bio-content strategist, communications professional, and steward of the Metapurse, the largest NFT fund in the world. Put your virtual hands together for the steward of Metapurse, Tubador and Elliot. Please take it away. Thank you so much for that introduction and an absolute pleasure to meet you, Tubador. How's, it, how's everything going with you? Likewise, Elliot. Had an interesting past few weeks, but I'm hanging in there. Yeah. Uh, well, it's really nice to have you here to discuss uh, everything that's been going on within the NFT space, because quite frankly, I think about six months ago for a lot of people imagining the level of exposure that's currently happening within the NFT space would have been almost unthinkable. Um, how does it feel for you? And uh, was this something you expected? Not this quickly, no. Just one second. Sorry about that, Elliot. There's a bit of uh, background noise there, some construction work. Uh, no worries. Quite appropriate for what's happening in the NFT space as well. Uh, to answer your question, uh, we did sort of expect something like this would happen, but uh, had no idea it happened so quickly or at such scale. Uh, and it's typical of crypto to take you by surprise, right, every few months. So it's exciting, it's inevitable, and uh, in a sense, it's good that all of the people in the space don't have too much time to plan and sort of set their strategies in stone. Uh, it keeps us flexible and on our toes. So yeah, it's a good time to be in NFT space. So how much warning time did you have? How long have you been in this space collecting? Uh, and what really brought you to this space in the first place? How did you get so deeply connected to this NFT uh, growing economy? Well, the idea of Metaverse has existed in Metacoven's head uh, since uh, as early as 2017, early 2017, when he discovered uh, Decentraland for the first time. You know, this concept of uh, inalienable ownership of something was very powerful to him. Uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, people in the US or in the West may not be able to uh, truly relate to it, but to be able to own your land in a way that can't be taken away from you or you can't be bullied out of it was very powerful. So that's kind of the start of the NFT journey for us. Uh, we went on to collect a lot of... Uh, culturally significant NFTs since. We have an Urbit Galaxy, for instance. Uh, we have uh, the Delta Time Triple One, which is the first uh, digital car that the Formula One put out. We have uh, First Supper, which is a first work of programmable art. But when the pandemic struck, right, in, in March and in April, when we started to think about, uh, um, you know, our place in the scheme of things and how it would change our lives and all that, um, I started to discover art, crypto art and it sort of uh, became the starting of a rabbit hole for us and we started to accelerate the way we look at NFTs and the way we collect. Uh, at some point uh, um, our theses, right, Metacovins and mine about the NFT space converged. We began to realize that NFTs are the catalyst that would take crypto mainstream and uh, that this renaissance that you see around us today is driven not by financial instruments alone but by culture which is what is going to make it, uh, you know, all the more powerful and sort of uh, self-sustaining. So that's kind of how I, I fell into the rabbit hole. I think, I think that's really interesting that you started with Decentraland because obviously uh, it's so clear and apparent the use case for NFTs when they're inside of a game or inside of a virtual experience. Um, the question of utility is pretty clear. And I think that makes them a really natural fit for uh, user adoption as well. Um, what makes you value an NFT uh, when you see one? What kind of uh, framework are you using to, to bring value and, and to assign value? Man, that's such a... Um, okay, there's, there's two or three ways, 
right? One obviously is the utility that you spoke of. That is, uh, uh, if it's very apparent, and if that utility has some sort of a scale built into it. For instance, it's useful today under the circumstances that we have in the infrastructure that it exists today. Awesome. But can that be scaled tomorrow when you know these worlds that we see become even more high fidelity worlds? When newer models of DeFi start to infuse into the NFT space and so on, so that the narrative that an NFT carries uh, is it going to remain relevant in the next year or two is something that we really look at. On the other hand, when it comes to um, abstract elements like say art, you have to sort of engage even more closely with the creators, with the ecosystem itself. You can't distance yourself from it and uh, go buying art. Right? For instance, one of the things I do when uh, purchasing art is to go shopping with the artists themselves. And it's such a, a beautiful experience. Instead of uh, thinking and sort of scratching your head going, okay, uh, why is this art important? Uh, uh, and sort of thinking about it from just an individual perspective, I go shopping with the artist, ask them what their favorite pieces of art are, who, uh, who, who the artists are that they admire. And those become part of the Metaverse collection. So we feel a lot better about it. Uh, but at the end of the day, Metaverse has not sold a single NFT so far. So the idea that we're not looking at this in, uh, um, you know, from a purely, from a purely uh, financial lens or from an upside lens, I think is our sort of edge that we have in this ecosystem. To be able to collect it for the sake of the value that it gives to the ecosystem rather than just to Metaverse, I think is important. So, so that brings me to the next question, and thanks so much for that that outline. But you know, your role here has been a truly transitional and important role for NFT, specifically mm-hmm. NFT art as well. Uh, do you view yourself as a you know a steward, a custodian of the NFT uh, industry here, of the NFT economy at large, um, with what you guys are doing with MetaPurse? I think uh, I view myself as a fan for the most part. I think uh, uh, that will never change. Um, I quite frankly fell in love with this space and uh, I, I wouldn't want to change that ever. I mean, to assume uh, a role like uh, uh, being a steward of an entire ecosystem is, is too much, right? It's hard to comprehend. Where would you start? On the other hand, if you start off as a fan of these creators, first maybe uh, a handful of creators and then the circle of uh people that you admire tends to grow and sort of fold outwards. That's, uh, that's kind of how uh, we see ourselves, me individually, as well as Metapurse as a whole. I think when you look at it from, uh, from that lens and start to create experiences around the NFTs uh, that you own, that you tend to collect, it, it strangely has a nice ripple effect across the entire ecosystem. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of the mindset that you t- saw some, you know, VCs and investors take to DeFi in its early days, uh, how there was a big belief that if investors just kept holding and put all their funds in and kept snowballing the value of DeFi, that everyone's projects would grow together. And uh, and it feels like you're taking a similar approach to what's going on here with NFTs, which is just if everyone invests heavily and aggressively uh, and idealistically into these certain projects, uh, then the NFT space can just keep ballooning and growing. Um, is that the way that you, is that the kind of momentum you hope to inspire with Metapurse? Not in just a certain uh, number of projects, right? I think uh, we would we would rather people took the example of uh, the way in which we look at NFTs rather than focused on the projects itself that we were looking at. For instance, uh, what might appeal to us or what might speak to us are, uh, are these uh, set of artists and, and creators and NFT builders and enterprises. Uh, those that speak to you might be entirely different. And that's the sort of vibe we need to bring in, right? Uh, I should look at an investor and, uh, and go, wow, that guy has conviction. Uh, he really likes uh, this particular art. And maybe that's how I should look at investments as well. Uh, if I'm going in, I better go all in, put some proper skin in the game rather than try to dip my toes and, and wait till it starts to prove itself. Well, I love it. And I think everyone in this space, uh, it has to be a bit of a fan of some of the moves that you guys have yeah. made. Um, obviously, we can get to some of the more historic ones a, a little bit later. But what, what do we just see? What stage of NFT adoption of NFT recognition have we just seen in the past oh. few months? Uh, and then... Of course, what comes next? I mean, uh, 
like it or not, for good or bad, it's become part of mainstream conversation. And that's always a good thing. At least there's a conversation right now. People are starting to engage with it instead of dismissing uh, something outright or constantly piling criticism on it. And I think that's a very important distinction uh, between some of the early epochs of crypto and what's happening in the NFT space. Because, uh, you know, it's like uh, Metacone once said, right? You might say, you know, I don't agree with the uh, NFTs. I think this drop is uh, uh, silly that this uh, artist or this brand shouldn't have done that. But, you know, I went and bought this one for my collection but it, because, it, because I thought it was really pretty, right? So when I say people start to engage with uh, this, even if they don't get crypto, even if they don't get Bitcoin or the blockchain or whatever it is, they understand NBA top shots. They understand an async art piece in a sense. They understand digital art. They understand axes because they can actually go and engage with all of these things. And I think that's very powerful. Uh, obviously, that's exactly where it's going next. All of these projects which have built during the crypto winter and have achieved some state of fidelity will start to you know, rise to the forefront. They will uh, create these pockets of experiences around the NFTs that we're collecting. Uh, I feel that the Cambrian explosion that we're looking at uh, around us today is just the tip of the iceberg, right? It's all about collecting. You know, I want to gobble up all of these NFTs right now. But then people start to ask themselves a few months from now, what do I do with these NFTs? How do I use this, uh, you know, gaming collectible that I have, rare as it might be? What do I do with it now? What do I do uh, with this work of art, which is valuable, but I, I want to experience it uh, better. What do I do with it now? Uh, and so the answers to those questions are going to be so interesting. And all of those answers lie in the projects that have been building over the crypto winter. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think that what you're seeing is really just the beginning of people understanding about the ownership uh, and that it's it's got to involve an aspect of utility going forward. Otherwise, you're kind of missing out on one of the best gifts that this technology gives you, which is its programmability. And uh, just like anything, uh, anyone who pushes the technology to its maximum, to its edges of use and utility, that will help gain much more uh, adoption. So I agree completely. And I love your examples, obviously, of the gaming. Uh, at Superfarm, we focus heavily on gaming and NFTs. Um, I wanted to focus on some of the assets you've bought. Uh, you mentioned you bought the F1 Delta Time car. Uh, I think you know this is one of the first NFT gaming ecosystems uh, that did a really big licensing deal as well. Uh, what drew you to the F1 Delta Time ecosystem? Well, this was all Metacoven, right? Uh, uh, to be honest, uh, I hadn't even been exposed to the NFT space uh, when he did this. But the thinking is pretty clear. It's like, uh, if you had a chance, would you do it? And how would you value it? So it's, it's that kind of a historical uh, aspect to it, right? That's that's one one part of it. And uh, quite frankly, uh, Elliot, this, this aspect of uh, bundling a, a little piece of history or that narrative inside an NFT is going to be way more sustainable than utility alone. Uh, because utility often takes time to materialize, right? It takes a little bit of time for the infrastructure to catch up, for interoperability to come into effect. Until then, the fuel that's going to sustain value for these NFTs is that narrative, is that piece of history. So I think that's what uh, led Metacoven to buy, uh, you know, the Delta Time Triple One, which... I think in 2019 was the highest sold NFT, uh, $111,000, which uh, doesn't seem like a lot of money today, but uh, it was uh, in NFTs at, at that point in time. Yeah, I mean, oh, certainly, uh, certainly I historic. The, I'm, I'm sorry, I, uh, I, I forgot to uh, I have an addendum for that. Uh, the reason why Delta Time Triple Ones become uh, you know, even more interesting as time goes by is that all of the collectibles they dropped uh, you know, in the first uh, two or three tranches have turned out to become cash flow tokens, right? They start to pay themselves, pay for themselves because they uh, have a very real utility in the uh, in the game itself. It comes back right into your territory now. So until uh, you start to play those uh, games and start to earn money, the narrative sort of uh, is powerful enough to hold its ground for two years, two and a half years. And then utility kicks in and... So are you actually playing uh, F1 Delta Time? Uh, does does Medicovan play it? We have a team that does, yes. Okay. Medicovan does. Uh, so 
why don't we talk a little bit now about Medicoven? Um, how did you guys meet and become connected? Uh, and what do you know? What can you tell us about you know his psychology towards NFTs? He's a bit of a genius uh, in that sense. I don't use that word lightly. Um, he found uh, Bitcoin in 2013. Um, he was uh, an app developer in uh, in a South Indian state where where I live as well. So we worked together on uh, on a project. We we became friends and we were sort of discussing all of these things. The amount of information, the packet of information he had about Bitcoin was enough to sort of give him wings and to start to become a serial entrepreneur in crypto. He's got a couple of them under his belt, including the Y Combinator funded bit access and Lendroid and so on, so many others. But that same packet of information in 2013 left me completely unaffected. I understood uh, the words that he was saying, but I had no clue on how they actually fit together. So it took me a, a much longer time to uh, catch up with what he was talking about, with the concept of, uh, with, of ownership, of immutability, of financial freedom and so on. Uh, I had to do several other rounds in, say, corporate communications and fintech and supply chain finance before I caught on and sort of joined the bandwagon. But for me, our journeys, hence, are, are, are like diametrically different in that sense, right? His is uh, capturing one uh, sliver of opportunity and sort of riding wave upon wave of interesting ideas and concepts and wealth building and capital infusion and so on to get to where he is. Mine is a series of missed financial opportunities until I discovered the NFT space. So if someone were to look at our journeys in parallel, uh, if they were a, a left brain person, they'd say, I'm going the uh, Metacovan route, I'm jumping right in and riding that wave. If you're a right brain person or inclined towards uh, creative pursuits like I am, you'd say, I can skip the first three or four years of this guy's crypto journey and jump straight into the NFTs and make my mark. So, so thank you for, for sharing that as well. Where do you see uh, the, the most interesting activities happening right now? And how is it different uh, than even three months ago? Uh, as I believe, you know, I think it was late January, early February, things really changed. Um, and then obviously, uh, are these changes good? Are they, are they healthy uh, that you're seeing? Well, uh, the thing about changes, especially in this space, is you, you can't do anything about them. And plus, especially when you think about the fact that you might have caused a few of those changes, uh, I don't think I'm going to complain <laughs> too much. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, you definitely but, uh, have caused some changes. <laughs> yeah. But here's the thing, right? Uh, a lot of these changes are inevitable and I suffer from the same amount of uh, FOMO that you do and the same amount of anxiety of uh, waking up in the middle of the night, uh, checking your phone, going, what have I missed in the last four hours of uh, when I was sleeping? So that, that part is, is constant. And the beautiful thing is uh, I had that same level of FOMO or anxiety eight months ago when relatively little was happening in the space and I continue to do so. So in a sense, uh, the number of interesting things happening in the space have sort of remained constant for me. If you were to drop into the space right now, it would be incredibly overwhelming. But uh, because you've been in the space for, for a while now, you are at least aware of the patterns of uh, projects that are sustainable, that have a really uh, you know, um, powerful narrative, which you can focus on and sort of drown out a lot of the other noise that's going on. I think it's good for the space. I think it's good for, uh, for the mainstream to have a lot of attention here. But that has never been the goal of the NFT space from the beginning. Uh, we're not, none of us was really looking for mainstream adoption from the get-go. We just, uh, you know, it's comparable to early days of, say, uh, the SNL network or something, right? It's, it's not a rarefied uh, atmosphere of uh, a bunch of people plotting uh, to build something extraordinary. It's just people horsing around. Uh, trying new creative and crazy ideas and finding gold in the process. So considering that, you know, it's been pretty much experimental up to this point, uh, as you've said, with the NFTs, uh, you know, is this currently an era that has enough infrastructure, that has enough, uh, you know, essential mainstream tools set up for true adoption? Or are we still a cycle away? Are we still several years away from seeing NFTs uh, make their way into each and every type of consumer product? I don't think we are uh, um, a very long way off. Obviously, uh, 
the regulatory ecosystem uh, is going to catch up sooner or later and that might uh, slow things down uh, a touch but even on the infrastructure level i think we we have enough to sort of go on and to onboard a lot of uh, new ideas into the space new brands models that uh, you know um, animoca brands have uh, have shown or uh, you know nba top shots have so has has shown or even lava labs right uh, so the, the most basic template for uh, you know desirable nfts was created by them and they have become infinitely scalable uh, simply uh, because of the fact that they're so simply structured so i think there is room here uh, for a lot more to come on i don't think we need to wait too long uh, to see mass adoption what are the the non art side the non collectible side what are the the more i guess surprising use cases given what people know about metapurse and metacovan uh, and the purchases um, mainly have been you know most notably recently in the art world um what non art investing are you guys doing obviously we know about the delta uh, f1 delta time car as well um what what else sort of in the vein of this isn't really just an art piece uh, have you guys been looking into we have a strong background in the in defi so we're very curious about uh, new and emerging models that that are trying to solve the problem of liquidity around nfts are you just muted uh, you're on mute too bro okay, can you hear me now perfect. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh you didn't You said much. uh you said liquidity. Yeah. You said uh, you need liquidity yeah. for NFTs and then cut. Yeah, I'm uh, we're really interested in the convergence of DeFi and the NFT space and a lot of experiments even in the last 3 or 4 months as you might see around fractionalized ownership which uh, again partly we might have bumped up a little bit with B20 project are very interesting to us. Uh we love projects like say alethia.ai which are trying to infuse artificial intelligence into nfts in a way that you can now start to have conversations with your nfts whether it's a punk or your axes or even a parcel of land and so on we love even within art models that completely uh, shift the paradigm in terms of medium like async art it's like uh, the shift between cave paintings and uh, using an easel and a canvas and oil pastels almost so significant shifts not just in technology but also in terms of uh, idea are, are what we're really interested in. Are you guys obviously you, you mentioned you're interested in the DeFi space as it pertains to NFTs. Do you do any more traditional crypto investing? Obviously you mentioned Metacovan has a deep history of in, of being in crypto. I'm assuming that means that you guys hold a pretty diverse portfolio of crypto, right? Yes. <laughs> Uh do you guys uh, have any projects that you sort of publicly support or uh is it just more of a private uh private engagement outside of NFTs? Well, some of them are public and and pretty obvious right? Polkadot, uh Definity, Ethereum obviously and Flow, we are massive champions of uh, the Flow blockchain itself. But yeah, apart from that it's a it's a really diverse portfolio which ebbs and flows. What What are the biggest pain points that you see right now for NFTs? Uh what what's stopping uh some consumers from getting in? You see that's uh, I have a slightly divergent view when when it comes to adoption and sort of uh, uh barriers of entry. I think they are important in a way. I mean if if I didn't have the barriers of entry that I did in crypto, I would have made some really uh uh silly decisions probably given up my private key somewhere you know lost access to my wallet and so on and so forth i think some of these uh, barriers to entry are uh, are part of an important learning curve which sort of slowly acclimatizes people to the ecosystem uh, to the risks that are involved as well as to the processes that are important and uh, uh, that should not be either overlooked or undersold uh, even in the nft space right uh, uh, low fidelity worlds like crypto voxels don't i i don't think we we need to force them to come up to uh you know um cyberpunk uh, 2017 2077 yet it's fine it's part of the culture it's part of the ethos in that sense so i so i i don't think there are any pain points as such let the ecosystem evolve as it does and i think it's part of the charm to acclimatize yourself here so you think that and i think this is an interesting point of view 
you think that the pain involved with learning how to manage uh, basic crypto functions is a necessary pain that it's like it's a it's a good thing for people because then they understand that this is this is serious and you need to learn some things before you are able to actually safely navigate this industry you think that's a good thing yeah, i think that's a good thing because let's face it uh, elliot when you got into the crypto space did you look for a manual on how to do this or did you just jump right in yeah you, you jump right in obviously uh, and you make mistakes and those mistakes help you learn that's how everybody is going to do this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, here, at least the mistakes uh, are not uh, going to really bite you in the, uh, in the ass because, well, it's difficult to make those mistakes as well. You need to install uh, uh, MetaMask properly. If you abstract that away, uh, you never learn that it's important to protect your uh, private keys, for instance. Yeah, I appreciate that perspective. Uh, how you know committed are you guys to the principles of, I guess, decentralization and uh, self-hosting wallets, things like that. Do you advocate that people self-host their, their expensive uh, NFTs and things like that? And how do you guys, uh, how would you guys recommend people who are collecting NFTs store them if maybe they're not used to storing such valuable things uh, in their homes? Or... Uh, this might sound slightly contradictory to what I said, but uh, I think... Uh, decentralization is is definitely the goal, but the way we get there should be progressive rather than uh, completely sudden. Right? Uh, there is a balance which uh, you know. It's one of the reasons I admire Dapper Labs in the way they uh, approach and sort of uh, have a roadmap for decentralization rather than starting off with you know a very strictly decentralized platform which would uh, close the doors to any kind of interest or adoption. So I think it's nice to ease people into it. Uh, is Dapper Labs and what they're doing, is, is that the number one NFT uh, ecosystem in the world that they've created? Uh, and what's so impressive about Dapper Labs in your mind? It's just that uh, inherent ability to scale, right? I don't just mean uh, at an infrastructure level, but also at an idea level. They're able to capture a lot of uh, um, the attention that comes there, absorb it and sort of bring out a product or, uh, you know, an experience which people instantly understand and can engage with. That, that's, that's kind of why we uh, admire Apple Labs for that sense. Similar reasons, uh, Animoca brands. I uh, couldn't agree more. Uh, huge fans of Yat, uh, Yatsu over there at Animoca Brands yeah. and everything that they've been able to accomplish. Uh, they've been huge supporters and are big partners of Super Farm as well. Um, what is some projects that you guys have coming up that you guys are focused on that maybe people aren't aware of yet um, that you can talk about uh, that maybe they'll be coming out or there'll be uh, more publicity around them in the coming weeks, uh, maybe months? Uh, what are some things on the horizon that people can look forward to? Okay. Um, you know, without name dropping too much, I mean, we have spoken about Alithia. We've spoken about Async Art, which I think will become, uh, I think it's interesting to look at uh, infrastructure projects also, uh, which are typically not as flashy as the other ones. But uh, the way I describe it is sort of a, a SaaS model, software as a service model, which allows new ideas to quickly integrate and sort of become, uh, uh, you know, dApps onto, onto the Ethereum blockchain or a blockchain of their choice. That doesn't exist yet. Uh, I don't think it does in, uh, in a very powerful fashion. There are some that are doing really good work there, which, uh, you know, uh, we're looking closely at. Uh, that'd be interesting to see. What do you think from an infrastructure standpoint would be something that you would hope gets developed soon? I'd say, um, you know, we have to sort of arrive at uh, a proper scaling solution sometime soon. Uh, either we settle in on one blockchain, we can't have a bunch of uh, uh, potential blockchains running around, right? We have to settle on something. So I'm looking forward to when we make that choice. By we, I mean the entire ecosystem. It's not just one person here or there. That's one. The other um, thing that I'd love to see solved is interoperability. And I don't mean that in any sense of uh, setting a standard for NFTs, right? Because I think that'd be a bad idea and would be restrictive to the NFTs, but rather uh, have uh, you know ideas where 
you have a single NFT, uh, which which can become a sort of a um, obviously it is uh, it's a point a digital pointer at the end of the day, which unlocks uh, very specific features in each platform instead of be having separate NFTs for each. That's how I think we can achieve interoperability. For instance, a voxelized uh, a gaming collectible on Sandbox can take a very different form and still point to the same NFT in another world. Do you think that the econ- that. Do you think that the economics of, for example, the gaming industry can allow for one item uh, to have significant meaning in all the different titles? I think it can, but fortunately, it's not a problem I have to sit and solve. Uh, I'd just be happy to support the other one. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Um, so infrastructure, art, um, for someone who is maybe just new to this whole thing, uh, where would you say, can, can you hear me at all? Because you're on mute still. Uh, um, where would you suggest someone start if they're brand new to this and they're just really fascinated with the movement? You know, it's the second time I've been asked this question today, and uh, it's it's a it's a wonderful question. I think it's important. Um, I'd say uh, start with whichever bit of the space that you understand, right? And that's the beauty of the NFT space, uh, in a sense. I mean, if if you love uh, basketball, go to NBA Top Shots. If you love football, go so rare. If you love art, go to Async Art, super rare, and so on. So start with. Uh, any point that you understand rather than approaching it from an investment mindset. Uh, what do I buy to make money be a very bad question in the NFT space? You, if you go for these unique assets that that you think speak to you, I think that make for a very strong beginning. Not only would you understand the asset itself and be able to gauge if it has real value or not, you will instantly also understand uh, the economics behind it. Because now you understand the asset. Is is the NFT space an investment space right now or an experimental space? It's a uh, hugely experimental. Um, obviously, uh, investment itself is an exp- experiment, right? Uh, in a larger sense. But uh, only if you approach it as an experiment does investment make any sense at all. Otherwise, you're just putting it in the bank and waiting it, waiting for it to slowly and incrementally expand. If investment has to make sense, it has to be an experiment. So I think it's a bit of both, but... Thank you so much for that. Yeah, I agree that these assets are pretty much being treated right now um, as both fully experimental and uh, for a lot of people, uh, there's been a tremendous amount of gains. If any of these ecosystems do start taking off, uh, it shows that there is tremendous amount to be made that's shared by the community. And that's very interesting. I know uh, that was certainly true of the F1 Delta Time assets. Uh, they became extremely, extremely valuable. Um, for those who maybe uh, are in different creative industries uh, and are thinking about going to NFTs, what would be your pitch to them uh, on using the NFT instead of a traditional means of content distribution, say music, uh, movies, films, comedy? Um, do you see these being huge uh, avenues for NFTs? And if so, what would you say to these creators? Massive. I suppose uh, crypto art proved it uh, uh, best, right? I mean, the fact that uh, royalties are finally possible for artists is a very powerful motivator for them to switch to the system. For very similar reasons, music also, you have, you get to hold your own rights, you get to have control over the economics of your content. And that I think can be a very powerful motivator to any kind of creator. And uh, I mean, it was a privilege to sort of witness the process of how uh, royalties came about and to sort of uh, look at that story unfold. I think, uh, you know, uh, it was a collective of artists, uh, you know, led by Matt Cain, uh, Sparrow, uh, Lawrence Lee, Bard Einstein, and so many others, uh, you know, and supported by a platform like Super Rare, which made it happen. A 10% royalty is impossible in the traditional art world. And we have examples of artists who are now in the crypto space, like Lawrence Lee. He's in his 70s now. He, which I've made like four. years ago.
20 years ago. So those, uh, and this is the, again, the key, rather than uh, concepts or ideas or business model. So I'm, I'm not sure you cut out a little bit there too, Bador, but I'd love to hear a little bit more on this topic as you come back to us. So thanks so much for sharing all of your knowledge so far. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, getting to hear where you're, where you're coming at uh, this entire industry from. Uh, for someone who might want to be speculating on this in the next few months uh, for the rest of 2021, would you say that uh, it's easier to get into ecosystem projects, to actual tokenized NFT ecosystems? Or do you think that uh, people should be actually touching the underlying NFT assets as their, the way to explore the industry? I'd say don't speculate. Get in there and uh, start to engage with all of these uh, projects would be the best thing because uh, all of the three categories you described are very powerful movers of the NFT industry today. Uh, which ones specifically uh, you can engage only when you start to look at them deeper, to speak with the founders and the creators and stuff uh, across the board, right? But you're looking at NFT assets, about ecosystem projects, infrastructure, and so on. There's such a diverse mix right now. It's not just uh, one or two or three projects that you had uh, uh, many months ago. There's so many there. And even the new ones are, uh, are really interesting, but you need to engage with them. And uh, that's what this, uh, uh, this, this cultural renaissance forces you to do, right? It, it's a convergence of, uh, of, of, of finance, of technology, of, of culture, and it forces you to come out of your comfort zone. Uh, you can't make a decision based on numbers alone because you don't have any reference points uh, from the past for this industry. You'll have to get in there and sort of um, you know, speak to a lot of people, create a network, create a community, and then that's when you know. What do you think is... Uh, the way that most people are going to interact with their first NFTs. What do you think is the mainstream? What's the Facebook uh, moment for NFTs where you'll see everyone just touching and interacting with them? Uh, is it collectibles? Is it art? Is it video games? Is it actual real world possessions, insurance policies? Where do you see the big penetration? I think it's games for the most part. Uh, collectibles and games, uh, uh, sort of a combination of the two. Uh, both of these worlds, people understand very instinctively. And uh, also, it, it, it in, in a sense, it hedges their uh, the risk factor greatly, right? If I have a collectible, I bought it because I like it, and uh, I don't need to do anything with it. If it's a game, I enjoy playing it. That's why I'm in. So these two would be really powerful. Art also, obviously, uh, I feel because... Uh, it's my own personal experience, right? I, I don't know any artists in the real world. I know very few of them. Uh, but over the last seven or eight months, I've, I've uh, forged really strong relationship with close to 100 artists. What it does is to sort of uh, give you this sort of a culture shock and sort of upend a lot of closely held notions in your own head. And basically what engaging in art tells you, and this is what I'd encourage a lot of people to get into, is that you are worthy to engage with art, to appreciate art, finally. It's, it's not a feeling you have in the real world when art is locked up behind ivory towers. Well, I, I like that take a lot, and I happen to agree uh, specifically on your point about video games. Uh, you know, we recognized in 2018 uh, that the market in crypto was so driven by price appreciation and so driven down by price depreciation. Uh, that you know, we we spent some time saying, hey, what would be a product that would keep people in? And we came to the conclusion that if people were playing a video game in a digital world and possessing items within it, then the price of Bitcoin should be pretty irrelevant. Uh, and so, you know, that was kind of what inspired my own journey into NFTs. Was because, like you, I believe that this can be the thing that people digest, use, and without even really sort of thinking of it as crypto or as uh, you know probably investment, which, you know, a lot of people aren't financially literate and don't invest. So I think that you're absolutely right. I think NFTs are going to uh, probably be the first type of crypto that most people interact with. Uh, and uh, what do you think is the meaning of NFTs in the larger crypto industry? Uh, how, how does it interact with, how does it relate to uh, other things like uh, Bitcoin and things like DeFi?
sorry, I keep doing that. I think NFTs are the vehicle now. Everything else is under the hood, which wasn't the case before. But now that's that's kind of how it is. Uh, we'll have to accept that. Whether it's DeFi, whether it's the larger crypto space, all of that goes under the hood. The vehicle that people see, the vehicle that's going to take this entire ecosystem, the crypto sphere forward, is NFTs. I, I love that. I think that is a, a a big statement, one that I completely support. And after that, I have I have nothing else to add. Thank you so much, Tupador. That was a fantastic conversation. Uh, would love to keep uh, chatting with you off screen, but that's all I've got on my side. It was an honor to uh, have this chat. Awesome. This was a pleasure. Thanks so much, Elliot. Thank you. Thank you.